Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship. Very glad you could join us this morning on this uh, Labor Day weekend. Uh, this is a communion worship service. It's the first uh, Sunday of the month when we traditionally celebrate communion. And uh, everyone is invited to the table. Uh, we don't uh, uh, bar anyone who wishes to come. We have a, a bread and grape juice, and uh, we hope that you'll uh, uh, participate. The way that we uh, serve communion is we invite everybody to kind of come towards the center aisle. I'll be in the middle with bread, and then you can kind of return to your seats and pick up a, uh, a cup of uh, the grape juice um, and either drink it there or take it back to your seat uh, and take it there. Um, but we, uh, we do hope that you will participate and uh, take part and uh, find that uh, sense of uh, communion, uh, God's presence uh, in our lives and our sense of unity with God and, and unity with one another as we celebrate this uh, sacrament. Um, there are a number of announcements in the bulletin, uh, most of them having to do with next week. Uh, things really get started uh, this week and into next week. Uh, next Sunday, we go back to our uh, kind of regular schedule of uh, worship service at uh, 8 and at 10. And uh, we hope that you will uh, be back with us next Sunday at one of those two services. Uh, we will have a fellowship hour at both of the services, so following the 8 o'clock and yeah, following 10 o'clock, there will be fellowship time. The uh, schedule of the church really gets started next week. Uh, the choir gets going, uh, confirmation class gets going, the Wednesday afternoon lunch gets going. There is a lot to going on in the life of the church, and we hope that you will be a part of all of it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kai for being our uh, music leader this morning. I always look forward to hearing uh, her musical offerings, and uh, I am doing uh, the service uh, by myself this morning. I figured that uh, we're going to be asking a lot of our late worship leaders uh, once September starts with two worship services, so I thought I'd give everybody another Sunday off before we get started for the fall season. Um, just since I'm talking about it, if anyone would like to be a worship leader, we are always looking for more. Uh, right now we have uh, enough worship leaders to uh, get us through probably uh, two months worth uh, and kind of maybe more like 10 weeks, uh, so we have about 20 uh, worship leaders, uh, but we could always use more. Um, and so if that is something that you are interested in doing or feel comfortable getting up and reading scripture and helping to lead the uh, opening prayers, uh, we would love to uh, uh, add you to that list. Um, but I know it's not for everybody, so you know I understand that, certainly. Um, again, if you would please take a look, uh, the, the, the newsletter is out. Um, it's on the website. There are uh, paper copies available in the narthex if you have trouble accessing the uh, uh, newsletter online. But please do uh, take a look. Uh, we really do have a lot going on uh, as we get the year started. But let's uh, continue our worship with our uh, piano intro. <laughs>
Grow with us, God, to understand what it means not only for us to be your offspring, but to share this identity with the trees and rocks and creatures creeping, crawling, flying, and climbing through forests and boundaries. Open us to find our first neighbors and teachers in the forest today. Help us to look and listen, touch and hear the goodness and wisdom you have planted. Ground us in this wisdom so we can grow more and more into your history. Let's uh, pass and share the peace of Christ with one another this morning with our friends and neighbors. This morning we have a Two scripture passages. <clears throat> um, the first is from uh, the second chapter of Genesis. Um, this is, uh, many of you are aware that there are two distinct creation accounts uh, within the book of Genesis. And there are actually a couple of more sprinkled throughout the, uh, the, the, the Bible. The second one, uh, the first creation story, uh, God creates the world in six days and rests on the seventh. Uh, in this second creation story, this is the account that includes uh, Adam and Eve. And uh, one of the things that uh, we're doing in the month of September is celebrating a season of creation. And so we've kind of moved away from the lectionary just a little bit in order to focus on the gift of God's creation and our role as stewards. And so it is natural to begin with the story of the creation of the world. Uh, one of the things that the season of creation forces me to do um, as pastor or minister, uh, as somebody who's reading these texts uh, in, in order to write a sermon, is that it asks uh, me to look at the texts in a different way than I had before. So for instance, uh, this is Forest Sunday, and I have never noticed, uh, paying such careful attention to Adam and to Eve, I've never noticed that when the, the garden is described, the only plants that are lifted up are trees. And so it's very appropriate that on this Sunday in which we think about and consider the gift of God's creation and the gift of the forest. Uh, we begin with a story in which uh, the, the Garden of Eden is very much situated amidst the forest. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no vegetation of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight of and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and onyx stones are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, 
That was its name. The man gave names to all cattle, and to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Here is the reading from Genesis. Our second reading is from the book of Acts. Uh, this is a description of the Apostle Paul's evangelization efforts. Um, he is uh, amidst uh, the Romans, and uh, he witnesses a, a, an altar that is made to a, an unknown God. And this altar he claims for the God that he knows and for the Christ that he serves. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely spiritual you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Would therefore you worship as unknown? This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all people to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps fumble about for him and find him, though indeed he is not far off from each one of us. For in him we live and move, and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. Here ends the reading of our sacred text. May the Spirit add to our understanding of God's holy word. <laughs>
be together in prayer. Loving God, we give you our thanks and our praise for this day. We thank you for the beautiful world that surrounds us. We thank you for your presence in our lives and your presence here with us now. We pray, God, that your spirit might be upon us in such a way that our eyes and our ears, our hearts, our minds might be opened seeing your presence at work in the world around us and inside each one of us. We pray that your spirit might help us to use the sacred text as a lens through which we might see the world. Help us to see the path that you have laid out for us more clearly. Help us to walk that path more faithfully. Help us to be your disciples. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, many of you are aware that I, I grew up in uh, Connecticut. Uh, we, we lived in, uh, well, I was born in Springfield, but then very early in my life, around the age of three, we moved to Connecticut. We lived in a small uh, rural town uh, in, in Connecticut, Tolland, uh, kind of north central uh, Connecticut. And uh, our, uh, during my childhood, we lived in two different homes in Tolland, and both of them were surrounded by woods. Um, and uh, it was one of my, uh, if I wasn't uh, playing football or basketball or uh, trying to uh, play baseball or wiffle ball with my Friends, I was in the woods wandering. When I was younger, uh, my mom would let me go into the woods uh, as far as I could, as long as I could still see the house. Um, and uh, um, and then when it uh, started getting dark, it was uh, time to return home. In both homes that I lived in in Holland, uh, surrounded by woods, um, I was uh, surprised. Um, well, at first, I don't think it, it, it necessarily bothered me, but there were stone walls, stone walls in the middle of the woods with these huge trees. And uh, again, I just kind of accepted that there were people built stone walls in the woods. You know, that's what happened. It wasn't until I was a little bit older and uh, my mom had given me permission to go a little bit further in the woods uh, where I couldn't see the house any longer um, that began to wonder why would anybody build a stone wall in the middle of the forest that didn't make any sense. And then it was still later when I was probably high school or even college age that I realized that when those stone walls had been built, and most of the stone walls of New England were built in the early 1800s, uh, when those stone walls were built, those were completely clear pastures or fields. Uh, there were no forests because the land was being used for, uh, for farming, for uh, crops, and for uh, the grazing of sheep. Uh, in New England, there was actually a, a sheep um, like hysteria where everybody bought sheep because it was supposed to be a great investment and uh, the market was good for wool. Uh, but then it began uh, for, for dairy uh, animals and for uh, other grazing creatures. It wasn't until the West opened up in the 1840s and 1850s that those lands were left behind because it was no longer marketable to farm those lands in the same way that they had been uh, for a previous century. And instead, a lot of the farmers uh, moved west uh, into uh, Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and uh, Wisconsin. It was when the farmers left that the trees came back. And so uh, you, can, you can read about it, but there are now more trees in New England in the year 2023 than there were 200 years ago. With all of the development, with all of the suburban sprawl that has occurred uh, throughout New England and Connecticut and Massachusetts, um, yet still, there are more trees today than there were 
200 years ago. The forests have sprung up uh, where they used to be prior to farming. Uh, forests have sprung up, and so uh, those stone walls, while they had served a purpose, uh, uh, first just because New England soil is very rocky, and when you till it, uh, the rocks work their way up to the surface. Uh, and so farmers every year, uh, that was one way that they would uh, keep their kids busy, was that they would have to go into the field and get rocks out of the field so they could till and plant. Um, and what do you do with all those rocks? Well, you, you, you build a wall. Um, farming and agriculture, uh, the land has always changed around us. Uh, we tend to look at the uh, even like the north woods of Wisconsin and uh, imagine it uh, as this forested uh, uh, recreational area. But the same thing happened in Wisconsin that had happened out in New England. Um, except in Wisconsin it was the lumbering industry. Um, when this church was founded 125 years ago, probably 25% of Wisconsin's population was involved in the lumber business or in the logging business, uh, producing uh, wood planks, cutting down trees, um, making paper. Like all of these industries uh, were, were the backbone of Wisconsin agriculture. Uh, unfortunately, um, at the time, uh, there was not a lot of foresight to the future. Uh, not a lot of thinking about what is the next generation going to do. Um, in the 1830s and 1840s, the Menominee tribe lived in this area of Wisconsin, lived in most of Wisconsin. Uh, in the 1830s and 1840s, the Menominee tribe uh, uh, signed a couple of treaties with uh, the European settlers. Uh, America had just won the, uh, uh, well, a little bit previous, they had won the 1812 war. A lot of the Native American tribes had sided with the British. And so some of the uh, uh, those Americans viewed Native American peoples as kind of the enemy because they had signed, sided with the British. In the 1830s and 1840s, the Menominee people were kind of pressured into signing treaties. And that opened up Wisconsin to the logging business. And uh, what had been uh, pristine woodland, untouched and uh, uh, very lightly used for logging and management, um, was clear cut. So that uh, within 70 years, 99% um, of Wisconsin's woodlands had been taken off. Uh, the northern counties tried to sell that now barren land to farmers. And farmers went bankrupt trying to farm it. They broke their backs and they broke their bank accounts trying to farm it and had to abandon it. They're like, I think it's like four and a half million acres of Wisconsin um, had fallen into bankruptcy by, uh, I think, like 1920. What did the counties do? The counties uh, took the land back through forfeiture, and then they let the trees grow. And as the trees grew, they found that the streams cleared up. They found that the uh, animals that had uh, left or been killed uh, began to come back. And after the Second World War and into the 1950s, the forests continued to grow. And because the forests grew and the animals came back and the streams and the rivers cleared, uh, suddenly Wisconsin became a place that people wanted to go to, to, to fish, to hunt, and to find recreation. What is it about we human beings? Um, place into the Garden of Eden, a place filled with trees. Trees that are not only good for food, but pleasant to the sight. What is it about human beings that makes us go into a beautiful forested garden and want to just kind of turn it to our own use? We refuse to see the innate good 
in what God has created. I love the idea that I am standing this morning in front of a forest. It's a small forest around a creek. A creek itself that has been managed uh, and, and, and changed its uh, course in order to build a, a football field, but yeah, we have trees. And the trees are resilient. The trees are uh, uh, incredibly uh, able to, uh, to recover. What is it about who we are as human beings that we become so focused in on our needs that we can't see the forest for the trees? You know, the clear cutting of uh, the Wisconsin forests, um, it led to uh, erosion. Uh, it led to uh, the polluting of streams. It led to the death of, uh, of, of fish and wildlife. Um, one of the, the neat things, if you look at a map of Wisconsin, the Menominee tribe um, in the treaties that it signed gave, well, not gave, but they, they, were, they were paid, paid like pennies on the acre, but they were paid for the land that, was, uh, uh, that they signed treaties for. But if you look at a map of Wisconsin and you look at Menominee County, it's green. It's green because it is still filled with forest. If you look at the counties all around it, there's no more forests there. Menominee uh, were, were able to find a way to figure out how to um, harvest trees and harvest lumber in a way that yet still saved the forest, that allowed it to regrow that allowed it to continue its work of, of holding on to fertile soil and keeping the water, groundwater clean. What is it about human beings that we can't be more, more like that all the time? There are good news. There is good news about the creative world in which we live. We are beginning to learn more and more about how much of an impact human activity has on the world in which we live. We tend to uh, see ourselves as, as very small and the, the actions of any individual not having much of an impact. But I think more and more we are beginning to discover the, the, the words of, of the book of Genesis about how we and the creation around us were all made by the same God. The same God that Paul proclaimed to the Romans, to the Athenians. A God who created all of us. But it's not just about us. It's not just about me. But it's about all of God's creation. This morning as we Consider the forest. As we consider the forest, let us all think about and meditate upon the interconnectedness of all of us, the impact that all of us have on the world around us. Let's uh, share together uh, him. We are not our own, it's number 564 in the
your prayer. Loving God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for the gift of the people in our lives, our families, our friends, our circle of support. We give you thanks for the nurture that we have found. We thank you for the encouragement that we have experienced. We thank you for the love which we have been given through these relationships that have kept us strong in times of joy and times of great difficulty. We thank you, God, for the community of the church, for the strong bonds of fellowship, for the relationships that strengthen our faith and encourage our faithful witness in the way that we live our lives, the choices we make, the decisions we're called for. We thank you, God, this morning for the beautiful world that surrounds us, for the forests, for the trees, for the gifts that they give, both in the food that they produce and simply in the beauty that they share. God, we know we're not always the people that you've called us to be. Sometimes we act foolishly. Sometimes we act short-sightedly. Sometimes we act as if you have no claim upon us. But God, you know us completely. And within each one of us, you find reasons to love us. For we are your children. We are your beloved. And because your love for us, because your grace and your forgiveness is greater than anything we could do or leave undone, you continue to call us forward, forgiving us for the past and setting before us new opportunities, new ways to be and to be at work in the world, new opportunities to share love, to share compassion, not only with the people in our lives, but with all that you have created. This morning we lift up special prayers of joy for creativity, artistic talent and ability. We give thanks to Craig as been able to publish his book and tell his story about a needed life. Give thanks for Claude and Jana's daughter being married this weekend and pray for her joy. We know, of God, also that there are people who we know that are in deep need. We pray for those who are going through treatments and enduring therapies. We pray for those in the hospital. We pray for those who are awaiting test results. We pray, God, for 
individuals dealing with addiction. Pray for families immersed in conflict. We pray, God, for your healing touch. We pray for a new light of hope and healing. We pray for resolution and for peace. In the silence of our sanctuary, God, we lift up the joys and concerns that are known only to us and to you. Hear us as we pray. Loving God, thank you. Thank you for hearing us as we turn our attention to you. Whenever we turn to you, we find you are already turned towards us. And now we pray that you would hear us as we lift the prayer that Jesus has taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. At uh, this time, our ushers will receive the morning's offering. Let each of us give as we are able, according to the blessings which God has already given to us. Each time we share 
in this communion meal. So come and see. Let us come and experience and experience the mystery of the sacred meal. Would you please join me in the communion prayer? God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give our thanks to Oh, holy mystery, may your goodness flow through us like the river of life's redemption and justice. With all of creation, we look to you. We look to you as the one from whom all things have sparked. From subatomic particles to forested slopes, from strands of DNA to the deepest ocean trenches, we look to you, God, as the one in whom all life holds together, from the delicate balancing of soil and water and oxygen and light, to the delicate balancing of human personalities and faith and values. We look to you, God, as the one who fashions this table in multiple places, but with singular purpose, to offer an invitation and gather all, to offer unlimited forgiveness, to offer vocation with Christ, we pray, God, that all creation might be blessed in this meal, a reminder of life shared with and for others, and of community fashioned not on the basis of our differences, but by the truth that all are one in you. Amen. I invite you to be seated. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, on the eve of death, Jesus gathered with his disciples for the feast of the Passover. Remember how Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to you, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had all eaten, Jesus also took the cup. And he shared it with his disciples, saying to them, This is the cup of a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Loving God, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon this bread and on this fruit of the vine, on our gifts and upon all of us. Strengthen your universal church that it may be the champion of peace and justice in all the world. Restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. Be present with us as we share this meal and throughout our lives, that we may know you as the Holy One, who with Christ and the Holy Spirit lives forever. Amen. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless This cup is the communion of the blood of Christ. This time I invite um, our communion leaders to come forward that we might uh, take part in this holy meal.
May the God of mystery, the creator of the heavens and of the earth, this God invites us to open conversations, to discern connections, to seek always to develop relationships and communities of life and hope. We're called to align our lives with God's love for the whole world and to join our longing with desire for all generations to live, move, and be together in peaceful unity. Go in peace.